Hello and welcome to The Witness podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Alex Last. And today, using recordings from the BBC archive, we go back 100 years to November 1918, when in the final weeks of World War I, Germany was on the point of collapse and facing revolution. The whole life of the country was becoming grimmer. It was getting very difficult. The war was lasting too long and Germany didn't have a much chance of winning it because the conditions within the country were getting so very difficult. And there was a general feeling that the war as a whole ought to stop. This feeling was spreading very fast among the civilian population. And I saw that the war had to end soon That was the feeling shared by most of the soldiers I met in those days. They were fed up with the whole thing and they wanted to go home badly. After four years of war, by late 1918, the situation in Germany was desperate. First, there was the human cost. Two million German soldiers were dead, four million had been wounded. Germany's armies were in retreat, its main allies were defeated or on the point of collapse. But on the home front too, civilians had been struggling. Years of a British naval blockade on Germany had created shortages and hunger. Of course, the food situation got worse and worse, which got on everybody's nerves. Herbert Hase lived in Frankfurt. And diet consisted mainly of turnips one day and barley and prunes the next, and then it started again. And people got more and more undernourished. And my mother gave everything possible to the children of those people who had really no connections and didn't get anything else, were in a deplorable state of nutrition. Alarmingly for the German government, discipline within the armed forces was fraying. In 1918, when I became a soldier myself, I think discipline was getting rather slack. Heinrich Beutoff was the son of a German officer. You could see it on the streets of the garrison town, when soldiers coming from the front didn't take the pains of saluting officers anymore. They thought the officers in the garrison had a very good time, so why should they salute them? That was, considering the discipline in the Prussian army, a very great change. And it showed that something was breaking. For instance, my commanding officer was so afraid of a coming revolution that he made me sleep with a gun in my arm in front of his rooms in the night. I had to do that. Perhaps this experience shows that the German army behind the front was in those days, let's say September, October, November, not quite intact anymore. And uh, the average soldier, a lot of them, I think, had the feeling that the war was lost already then. They were not alone. In September 1918, the German High Command told the German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm that the war was indeed lost. Germany began to make peace overtures, but the Allies wanted total capitulation. The German military's top brass had effectively ruled the country during the war, but now defeat was inevitable. They wanted to abdicate responsibility for the catastrophe. So in the final weeks of the war, there was constitutional reform, a move towards parliamentary democracy – For the first time, leaders of the left-wing Social Democrats, the country's largest political party, were invited into government. But events on the ground were moving fast. There were strikes by workers, and in Kiel, sailors of the German Navy mutinied, demanding peace. Naval officer Edgar Luchting was in the city. The first signs of what was coming appeared in Kiel. There was some shooting In the morning of the 5th of November, I saw the red flag on board of my boat. It was a shock. The general feeling was, of course, well, now it's definitely over. And that was a feeling of the Kiel population, too. They were certainly mostly interested in coming to an end with this lost war, because then they could hope they would get food again. They were more or less starving since quite a considerable time. And from Kiel, protests escalated across Germany. Left-wing workers' and soldiers' councils were set up in major cities. There were calls for peace and democratisation, the creation of a socialist state. Some wanted to go further. Germany was facing a revolution. 
In response, peace efforts were stepped up and on the 9th of November, the Kaiser himself was forced to abdicate. And in Berlin, Germany was declared a republic. And the leaders of the Social Democratic Party took charge of the government, trying to stabilise the situation. When I arrived in the Foreign Office on the morning of the 9th of November, there were certain groups in the streets and unrest everywhere. But we didn't know the real truth that the Kaiser had left for Holland and that the German government had broken down. Baron von Rheinbarben was a German diplomat. There was no more government to decide what should happen. Only one man, perhaps. That was Herr Ebert, the chief of the Social Democrat Party. He remained in office. But we heard that Herr Scheidemann, another Social Democrat, had declared German Republic from the window of the Reichstag. The atmosphere was heavy with rumours. Eva Reichmann lived in Berlin. Then suddenly, I remember near the opera house, a red motor car chased through Unter den Linden. A motor car with a red flag with soldiers and a machine gun in front. Then others followed. A few shots were heard in the distance. The streets filled with little discussion groups uh, bearing banners or shouting, long live the Republic, long live the Socialist Revolution. There were thousands and thousands of people. There was a mob. They cried. They wanted the communists as new rulers. And I saw officers still in uniform. And I saw the mob taking away the epaulets of those officers. It was terrible. Then suddenly, the news winners turned up with new special editions. The Kaiser and the Crown Prince had abdicated. At that moment, it was a moment of extreme excitement. The uh, idea of monarchy or no monarchy didn't matter for me in the least. My only idea was that now the armistice was at hand. And within days, the war would be over, though the political chaos in Germany would not. For peace, Germany would have to accept harsh terms, but its military and political leaders knew fighting on was not an option. The German army was defeated and exhausted. The public would not countenance more futile slaughter. And yet, for soldiers like Hartwig Pohlmann, the defeat was still very hard to take. We, of course, knew that the bitter end was near. Our armistice delegation had crossed the lines near La Capelle on November the 8th. Two days later, HQ orders told us that the armistice will be concluded without delay. The emperor, the crown prince and all the federal princes had resigned. That same day, the new German Republican government of Ebert, Scheidemann and Hase asked our supreme headquarters to make sure that we, soldiers, should uphold discipline. Then we received on November the 11th the order. As from 12 noon, the guns are silent. The war is over. How we had imagined and longed for that very moment. But now Germany had capitulated. And in our state of despair, the retreat began. That's it for this edition of The Witness Podcast with me, Alex Last. We have hundreds more Witness episodes on all sorts of subjects which are available for you to download. And we have a special collection based on eyewitness accounts from the First World War on our website. Just search online for BBC Witness. That's all from me for now. Thanks again for listening. Goodbye.